Britons have already died. The famine caused by drought is the worst in living memory, and now the rains have failed again for the third year in succession. The relief organisations are doing all they can, but there just isn't enough food to go around. One of the worst hit areas is in the north of the country, where the problem has been complicated by two secessionist wars in Eritrea and Tigray. 40,000 refugees have converged on the town of Coram in the hope of getting some food and medical aid. Our correspondent Michael Burke has been back to Coram after four months and he found the situation far worse. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Coram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. Thousands of wasted people are coming here for help. Many find only death. They flood in every day from villages hundreds of miles away, dulled by hunger, driven beyond the point of desperation. 15,000 children here now, suffering, confused, lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. Coram, an insignificant town, has become a place of grief. The relief agencies do what they can. Save the Children Fund are caring for more than 7,000 babies. Every day they weigh them on a sling, then compare their weight with their height. By this rule of thumb, one in three is severely malnourished, starved to the point of death. This morning, another 114 babies have arrived. The choice of who can be helped and who can't among the constant stream of newcomers is heartbreaking. There's not enough food for half these people. Rumours of a shipment can set off panic. As on most days, the rumours were false. For many here, there would be no food again today. Two months ago, there were 10,000 people here. Now the latest harvest has failed, there are 40,000. There's nothing like enough food in the country, not enough transport to move it if there was. These people have waited all morning. They want food, they're getting clothes. Those naked and most needy are marked by a pen stroke on their foreheads before the distribution begins. An armed guard sits on the small bundles of cast-off clothing sent from countries in Europe. A few jackets, trousers and sweaters, once worn in the wealthy West, now handed out to starving people who have to live in the open through nights when the temperature drops to little over freezing point. Today, only a tiny amount of grain is being given out to those who have brought in firewood. People scrabble in the dirt as they go for each individual grain of wheat. For some, it may be the only food they've had for a fortnight or more. The Ethiopian government tries to persuade these people to go home, but that would make death certain. Better to camp here. Some of the very worst are packed into big sheds. 7,000 now, most apparently dying of malnutrition, pneumonia and the diseases that prey on the starving. This three-year-old girl was beyond any help, unable to take food, attached to a drip but too late. The drip was taken away. Only minutes later, while we were filming, she died. Her mother had lost all her four children and her husband. The situation is out of control. Whole groups are being ignored. These people have been without food for a month. A government truck arrived to pick up those most desperately ill and take them to the sheds that are already overcrowded. It was a quick and random affair. They took a handful, but hundreds here needed the food and shelter the sheds provide. Those left behind seemed at least as bad as those that were taken, clustering around us in a hopeless appeal for help. If nothing happens, I don't know what we are doing. If there is no food, uh, the medical treatment is a nonsense. Giving drugs to the people, giving uh, injections, giving tablets, if they don't have food, it's completely it's quite not ridiculous because we are here. And, 
How do you feel about the attitude of the rest of the world to this country? I am not a politician. I don't care at all about what's going on. Just I am a witness of Korea. And I know that if nothing is done, there will be thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who will die. Already we have thousands here. Only Korea. And Korea is nothing in Wolo. And Wolo is not the only place in Ethiopia. Those who die in the night are brought at dawn to be laid out on the edge of the plain. Dozens of them, men, women and children, under blankets or bound in sackcloth for burial in the local custom. For two hours the bodies kept coming from out of the encampment. This mother and the baby she bore two months ago wrapped together in death. As body after body was brought down, the grief became almost tangible. By quorum standards, it wasn't a bad night, 37 dead. Tomorrow, there would be more. The day after, more still. Once the bureaucracy of death is over, the bodies are picked up to be carried back to the villages they left in hope such a little time ago. A tragedy bigger than anybody seems to realise, getting worse every day. Michael Burke on the victims of the famine in Ethiopia. And reaction to that report shown in earlier news programs has Right. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. My name is Ben Parker, and I'm here to chair this panel. The event is uh, being held, uh, hosted by the Frontline Club and the Overseas Development Institute, and its uh, humanitarian policy group. So I'm going to say a few words uh, to start with, and then we have uh, questions among the panel, and then we'll open up to uh, questions and comments from the floor and perhaps from online uh, viewers. Um, hashtag is crisis reporting, and uh, please put your phones on silent. So that report sort of changed history, really. Um, at the time, it was 10 years after the revolution that overthrew Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. There had been the Red Terror of the, um, while the new communist regime, the military regime, had been um, establishing itself. There was civil war in the north, in Tigray and Eritrea. There were hundreds of thousands of people being swept up from the uh, troublesome highlands and being sent down to the malarial swamps of the southwest in one of the largest um, exercises in 
population engineering the country uh, or the region had, had seen. Um, but that report made its mark, I think, in certainly in, in this part of the world um, in a way that we're going to examine today whether that could even happen again. It changed um, certainly the political discourse in Britain. Um, it triggered a wave of, of public concern, engagement with disasters, with poverty, with development, with the developing world um, that I think um, has still stands to this day as part of the, the political agenda in, in the United Kingdom. It also um, set off and amplified, um, let's say, a style of fundraising and public engagement by aid agencies and charities, um, which continues even today. Some of the techniques and the, and the, and the styles and the methods of fundraising and raising public awareness um, are very, very much the same. Um, I think it also set some precedents for how the media deals with emergencies. And those, um, perhaps today, are not quite the same, but many have become almost institutionalized. In my case, that was very much my generation had a huge effect on me. And um, I ended up, after university, going to Ethiopia thinking I could maybe make a difference. And um, I'm not sure if I did, but I didn't come back um, for 20 years. So it certainly had a huge impact on my own life. So um, 30 years on, 2014 is becoming sort of humanitarian bumper crop of its own. Um, I looked up today, the current levels of humanitarian funding are $15.9 billion and counting. And I think even though we can remember the top disasters, we're already starting to forget some of the others. So we've got Ebola, we've got Islamic State, Libya, Somalia, but what about Mali, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and even Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it could be a, a record-breaking year for the, for the needs of people around the world and also a record-breaking year for the aid agencies that try to help. And at the same time, we have an uh, economic crisis, budgets are tight, public attitude is perhaps hardening or becoming fatigued, and the media coverage of these crises is also patchy and variable. So can a news moment like Michael Burke's piece happen again? Can it ignite the public? Can it change the course of history in a small way? Or have things changed so much in the, in the new media, the interconnected world that we live in? Does TV in that same way still exist? And can it have that public influence? So we've got a, a very impressive panel tonight. Um, and I think... Uh, you will be all looking forward to hearing from all of them. Um, starting from the left, Marc Dubois, who's a former head of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, United Kingdom, and until uh, this year. Um, Eva Svoboda is a researcher with the Humanitarian Policy Group of the ODI, and she is also a former aid worker with NGOs and the International Committee of the Red Cross in many countries. Juliana Rufus is a senior reporter for Al Jazeera's People and Power program with extensive experience in reporting from different um, crisis zones. John Snow, um, I don't think needs very much introduction here tonight. He's the Channel 4 News anchor and has recently been um, seen reporting from the front line in Gaza as well. So welcome to you all. I'm going to put a little bit more background and then open up for some questions. I think this relationship that I think the Live Aid, Band Aid era uh, set up became quite cozy between the aid agencies, the public, and the media uh, as the three pillars uh, of that relationship. And um, we haven't seen the end of telephones. We haven't seen the end of celebrities. In fact, we've seen it multiply and, and um, spread all over the place. Um, but all of these three groups are now experiencing their own change, in my view. They're going through their own revolutions and their own crises. And their, and their relationship between the three of them is also um, becoming different. Aid agencies, I'll start with, they're facing a crisis of relevance and of legitimacy. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of NGOs. Why? Um, 
they largely self-mandated. They create themselves and they create their own role and they have uh, some legal um, uh, parameters on what they do in different jurisdictions, but on the whole, they sort of self-create. And in their space, you know, China, the private sector, the Gulf, a whole load of new actors are moving in to the, way, the areas where the traditional aid industry worked, including the UN, and, uh, and it's been largely a Western-dominated kind of a business, and now that's also changing dramatically. And the other thing I think that's worth noting for the NGOs is that they are becoming the media themselves. They create their own B-roll, they create their own news packages, and um, even send reporters into the field. So how does that affect the relationship? The media, you don't need to be told, is in its own crisis. The business model is in serious trouble of traditional media. Um, there's a strange multiplying world of citizen journalism and uh, direct to the audience um, broadcasting from individuals that's changing the playing field entirely. Um, and the innovation um, and the new players that we've seen certainly don't seem to be compensating for the cuts in foreign coverage that we all know about uh, to a, a great extent. Finally, the public, I think, behaves differently in the way they wish to engage with issues. They, they want to click, they want to connect, they want to network, they want to petition, they want to somehow feel uh, personally involved, personally um, active. And uh, rather than just being on your couch and calling the free phone number, um, perhaps was possible in 1984, 85, that may not be enough these days. Secondly, they also have an awful lot of other things to distract them, and it's very easy to tune out of um, important, difficult, distressing news. So how do we expect the public now to feel enough, care enough, engage enough to make a difference for this growing level of suffering that I don't think we doubt is out there in the world? And we see also that in the same tone, the, the public feels disenchanted with the traditional aid agencies, they feel that they're sort of being cheated and manipulated by sentimental or emotionally uh, manipulative advertising and marketing, and the public are starting to express a crisis of confidence in the uh, charities themselves. So for that, as a scene setter, um, I think it's actually three or four debates in one. We were saying earlier on, it's may, we may struggle to, to stay uh, on uh, one topic. I'm going to start with John. I'll say, could something like the Michael Burke report today happen and have the same sort of impact? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I think I'll probably be in a minority, but I think we're in a fantastically good place. Uh, I remember <clears throat> as recently as uh, four years ago, um, landing in Santo Domingo and uh, driving in great luxury up to the border and the sudden impact of the poverty of Haiti and arriving in... Uh, Port-au-Prince to the most devastating earthquake in an essentially francophone, French interest place of great uh, deprivation. I thought the Brits have never been here, never colonized. They don't speak English. Uh, that nobody in Britain knows anything about them except a bit of Tonton Bacou and uh, uh, the old dragons that used to run the place. Um, you know, uh, Papa Doc, or, you know, a bit of sort of People had a bit of fun at his expense. And damn me, at the end of our experience there, reporting and the rest of it, and there were a lot of reporters there, at the end of it all, the Disasters Emergency Fund received the largest, second largest ever, uh, and to this day still, the second largest ever appeal. 107 million pounds was donated by Brits to a place they knew nothing of and cared even less about. So the idea that remote Ethiopia was some kind of aberrant 1984 uh, sort of prehistory kind of event. No, it was a great event and a most important event that set many, many uh, uh, issues running and, and, and many structures that flowed from it. But uh, um, uh, if you then, f and that incidentally, 2010 was a moment of great domestic austerity here. Even in that moment of austerity, people came up in a very short time with an enormous sum of money. Very soon after, there were the um, uh, floods in Pakistan. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we're talking in terms there of 70 million, which was a pretty, pretty big sum. Um, and again, there was, there was fine reporting. Um, Somalia in uh, 2011, and we were raising 79 million. I'm just going on the Disasters Emergency Committee, which is not the only 
uh, recipient of public funding. Um, but the stream uh, is certainly not dry. And I would argue that we're, our connected world, our digital world, is actually making it easier for us to draw attention. Now, of course, we're sitting in the middle of failure. Failure by the media <coughs> to deal adequately with Ebola. And there we are, hand in hand, with the politicians, with the diplomats, even conceivably with medicine, in that you know, we've, there have been warnings since March, and that's a long time ago, and basically, people did not get themselves onto the ground. Uh, it was, again, remote, three remote countries where it was happening. Uh, again, they were n only one of them had a, a British interest, and even that, we weren't sort of, many of us boned up on. And it's only now, right now, that people are getting onto the ground. And, uh, and therefore, the pressure on the politicians has not been there. I would argue that that is a particular case. I have to tell you that many, many journalists, many camera people, particularly people with young children, are exceptionally, I've never known people reluctant to go. There's a fantastic amount of paranoia about Ebola, um, you know, it, 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 and some of it justified, um, but the, the, the problem with understanding Ebola and understanding how you get it has only recently been cracked. We had our first briefing only this week uh, from, from an expert as to exactly what we could expect if we went. Um, and we have our science correspondent on the ground. Interestingly, he was the easiest guy to send because he actually genuinely understood the science, understood exactly how it could be got, and he's there now. We could not find a domestic cameraman to go. We hired a cameraman from abroad um, who was prepared to go. Uh, but, but everybody's got the same problem. Everybody has got grave difficulties in finding people who want to go. There's never a problem getting people to go to war, but pe getting people to go to a, at least as threatening an issue as a disease is very hard indeed, particularly when it's a sort of new and the rest of it. So I would rest my case here. I would say, yes, 1984 could happen all over again. Or was it 88? What, did, what year was it? 84. 84. Yes, 1984 could happen again. Funny to have had the Orwell issue first, and now we're dealing with 1984. But yes, it could happen again. Uh, but we should be warned by our failure uh, over Ebola because we have failed to put pressure on the politicians to do the things they should have been doing six months ago. I mean, if, if Britain had built the seven facilities it's building at the moment, six months ago we'd be in a very different place in Sierra Leone, and that's our fault. Thanks, John. We'll come back to Ebola um, with a question. Juliana, how do you think things have changed since that report? And, you know, you are among among the journalists and the aid workers, you both travel out you know, into these places. We talk as though there's a certain amount of them and us. How do you feel things are now compared to them? I actually slightly disagree with John, which is a bit scary. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, think <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think maybe the, if you look at it in terms of quantity of money, maybe you can still look, the, look at the successes and you can say there's more money that's gone out. But I think the quality of giving has changed. I think in, at, at the time of Michael Burke, the world was a really easy place. Um, you know, you, you had the us and them. You had a white audience maybe looking at black starving people. You had, um, you know, there was an easy solution. You donate money to, to, to Ethiopia um, and you learn the lyrics to the song, We Are the World, and then you could tuck into your Christmas turkey and, and, and the world was good. And I don't think it's that simple anymore. I think the, the whole interconnectedness that you speak about that enables giving also creates a cynicism in that these days we're not going to tuck into the Christmas turkey in quite the same way because we start thinking about is it our wealth that actually disempowered other nations and we are aware of um, aid being embezzled, we are aware of, um, I don't know, I mean some people may be aware of if you give money to Somalia to WFP they're paying taxes to warlords at checkpoints and who's actually getting my money, is it the administration, is it the warlords, so there's a whole series of complexities that have unfolded that um, yes, maybe more money is being given, but, but the whole idea of the shy, uh, nine, um, knight in shining armor, not just the aid worker, but also potentially the journalist that goes in, that's no longer the same. Um, we, and, and I also think the disasters and the conflicts that we're giving to are more complex, uh, complex on another level. You know, at, 
we, I started journalism in a, in a post-Cold War environment where I went into places where Africans were fighting with each other and I was neutral. I was the good person going in reporting. Whereas now if I look at the conflicts that are meant to be reporting and that you are potentially delivering aid to, I'm looking at <laughs> Syria, I'm looking at Libya, I'm looking at Somalia, I'm looking at places uh, where people want to um, quite frankly, kill me, kidnap me, whatever. Um, I'm looking at places where potentially we, we have people come from who want to head back at the UK. So I, th I think the complexity in all of that, the, the us and them, which was very simple when Michael Burke made his films, um, has totally shifted. Um, if, if anything now, I think there is an us and them that divides me in a way that I can no longer report adequately um, because I have become the them in a way that I'm the enemy. I'm no longer the savior. I'm potentially going into environments where I'm the savior, and I think that's a similar fate, potentially, that's, um, you know, um, that aid agencies are dealing with, too. And Ava, you're looking at this as an analyst these days, although you used to be a, a, an NGO and an International Red Cross worker. Is it more complex, or is it the same? No, I do think it's more complex, and looking back at my experience, which is not 30 years ago, but 20 years ago, you would not have comms officers, you would not have media spokespersons. Now you would not find an organization that does not have a dedicated comms department, that does not have a, a media um, a spokesperson. It has become a lot more sophisticated, partly because there is more, like you were saying, more um, competition. If you go back even further than 84, in the 70s, pretty much it was MSF and ICRC, nobody else. You know, even UNHCR was waiting for refugees outside, you know, of their country. So there are a lot more actors, there's a lot more competition, there's a lot more accountability as well, which is a good thing. Um, but it also means for aid agencies that they need to be a lot more um, precise in what they're saying. Uh, and that's always a dilemma. How do you bring <laughs> the message across about a very complex kind of environment to say, you need to give money so we can do this because that, you know, in two minutes. Like when people would ask me, could you explain the Middle East conflict in two minutes, please? And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's a bit difficult. But how do you bring that across? So to say, it's important that you understand that we will be treating enemy combatants, for example, and that's perfectly within international humanitarian law. Um, and at the same time, people saying, but you can't, these are bad people. So how do you bring that message across? And I think partly that accountability is very good because aid agencies can no longer just say, we are the knights in um, whatever, shining armor. You know, we will save people. Any organization that claims it will save people you know, you have to be modest about it. Partly, it's not quite true. You have to be extremely modest. You might save some people. You might be alleviate some of that suffering, but it will be extremely limited because very often you will be faced with people who just don't care, with states that don't care about their international obligations, with armed non-state actors that, yes, will ask you money, that will, you know. Um, so I think it's, it's important. Um, Yes, there's competition, but there's also there needs to be honesty about what can be done. Um, and that's not always easy because, again, aid organiz organizations need the money to do the work. And how do you do that? By selling a story. So it's that dilemma that I find particularly <coughs> difficult. And as an analyst, it's very similar. You know, I do research. How do I sell 10,000 words? you know, of a very complex kind of, I've done a lot of research, I've given it a lot of thought. How do you sell that? How do you make people interested in something that's called protection? Protection of civilians. Well, that's not gonna grab a lot of headlines. So it, it's, it's quite difficult to find that balance between trying to bring something quite complex across in a simple way and staying true to what you're trying to say. Mark, you were a card-carrying member of the White Saviour Industrial Complex, as, yes. it's been, uh, uh, as it's been called. What do you think is going on? Who's fatigued? Well, with that introduction, <laughs> it's good to have been out and to be out of it. Um, yeah, there, I mean, you hear a lot about donor fatigue and uh, compassion fatigue and disaster fatigue. And, and I, I think on, on that, on that I, I line up with John. I think 
Disaster is inherently interesting. It's compelling. People love seeing disaster. My, my daughter spends half her week looking up fail videos on, on you know, <laughs> this is disaster at the small scale, but it is inherently compelling. And I think compassion is another thing. We, I think humans are hardwired to feel compassion. I think people feel good about feeling compassion. I think they give out of a sense of compassion, and I think compassion is alive and well. You know, you look at the story around the dog Excalibur, you know, in Spain. I mean, you know, the, the whole world knows that dog's name because, <laughs> be, and, and this is why, because that dog wasn't a statistic. It had a name, and we, we told an authentic story about it. And it goes back to a little bit about what you're saying, about bringing people in and touching them away, in, in a way. And I think, I, I think that's all alive and well. I think with, with, with what's not so alive and well, I, I think, you know, Western agency, Western aid agency fatigue is, is, is growing. And I think Haiti is a great example, which I think shows, I think, a little bit about what everyone's talking about here. If you put images like that on the air, you will get donations. You will get massive donations. It is, it is a shame in some ways, but you can tell an interesting story. You can put all the commercials. You know, I used to be the one in the office who had to say, yes, that commercial goes out, that one doesn't. And it is... It is a really difficult thing because absolutely interesting, you know, compelling commercials. You know how much money they make? Nothing. <laughs> you know what it makes when you have a baby alone on a cot where you take the mother and tell her to get out of the way and you have the flies on the eyes and you hold it there and it has to be a hold for three seconds. If it's a hold for one second, you don't get as much money. That's, that's how good these companies are at telling you exactly how to get the money in. And, and this is the real dilemma these days, because aid is not cheap. And I, I, I feel that aid agencies, to a certain extent, are, are married. You know, it's, it's in the DNA to tell this almost Victorian story about, you know, disaster, you know, death, dying, and suffering, which then creates sympathy and compassion and motivates politicians to move. And I think what, what John said about Ebola is exactly right on that. And it, 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 it motivates giving. And at the same time, it's sort of the seeds of its own undoing because we know, you know, the, we know the story isn't that simple. The Haiti story a year later and two years later is a story of billions of dollars that didn't get there. You know, it, it's of displaced persons who are still under the original tarp, plastic tarp they got, you know, four and a half years ago. And it, it, there is a very, uh, you know, alive and well critique of aid. People like Dumb uh, Dumbisa Moyo, you know, Dead Aid, uh, Bill Easterly, Tyranny of the Experts. I mean, you know, that has moved into mainstream media as well. It's no longer a taboo story to talk about aid that's not working. And, and so we didn't go back to Michael Burke's disaster to see, you know, what really became yeah. of the aid there. I mean, and therefore, in a sense, we, we are debating together a moment, a moment when you trigger... That's what Burke did, a moment. Um, and, and I'm saying that moment's still with us. Do you, think, do you think the media should be so much involved in the fundraising? Should, should, do these aid agencies get enough That's scrutiny? I, I, I never you, give, you, give you're fundraising a thought when I'm in the field. Not, not a thought. It doesn't interest me at all. It, what interests me is to tell the stories of the people that are there. Uh, and, and, and maybe what... what, what those agencies that are there are doing, but I'm not interested in trying to raise any money. That's not my business. If people want to use my pictures to raise some money, that's up to them. I mean, we're, we're not in the field to raise money or to bring relief in any form. Um, we're, we're there to tell the story. And if the story triggers reaction, and I'm saying the story still triggers great reaction. And I, the one thing I would like to say in common to you is that the difference between now and then is that people are connected, connected to agencies. There are people who absolutely rock solid with you, with Amnesty, with Save the Children. It's, it's their bread and butter. They, 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 they scrimp and make sure they give a regular donation to them and the rest of it. And I think that's much more than it ever was uh, in, in 1984. And, and, and the fact that you can, be, you can have digital alerts and the rest of it is all grist to the mill and some, the mill we didn't have before. Giuliani, you've been, we've been talking about how things don't get followed up and the boring bits <laughs> often don't get uh, the attention. You've been trying to interest your audiences in different ways. 
Can I introduce this audience to the word gamification? <laughs> yeah, that too. I mean, firstly, I would say that there, there, there is also a fundamental difference in, in some ways to what I do um, to news. I mean, new, news goes in when a story is breaking. I'm programming. I make 25-minute films. I sometimes make investigative films. And I'm, I, I, I sometimes feel like I... I I don't want to sound funny, but I know the story that's being written when news breaks. It's either a disaster story or it's a conflict story. And I like to go in in between or in the aftermath. So I went to Libya last year because on a, on a personal level, I was more interested in, in where Libya is at now. I've just been to Somalia. Uh, again, for me, the question is, how is actually the Somali government that was greeted with such euphoria and that has a lot of international money, how, how is the government managing? So I, I actually like to go in... Um, <coughs> sort of when the news aren't there. And I would also say, is, you know, yes, it is great that we're getting a lot of money online, and yes, that it is great that the dog in Spain or wherever it was gets a lot of hits, but let's look <laughs> at it statistically. If you put a cat video on YouTube, I mean, sometimes we sit in the office and we look at cat videos and the ratings they get, they get phenomenal ratings. I don't get near the ratings when I do a story. So let's put the ratings into perspective. I wish I would get the ratings of a cat video. Well, I, cat, did in cat I can tell you I did in Gaza. You know, we got no, fantastic that went ratings. went viral. Yeah, no, sure. And, 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 and I think most people that were there got fantastic ratings. Because actually, the truth of the matter now is that more people know more about what's going on in the world around them than ever in history, far more than in 1984. But and do what they concept? care about it? In do they do anything well, about I mean, it? But, that, but uh, that's not a question Burke was asking. He wasn't wandering around saying, I wonder if anybody cares about what I'm doing. I don't think he needed to ask it at the time because the world was a different place and because the world was a simpler place. I mean, I think one thing that's changed fundamentally, and we were talking about that earlier on, when I as a journalist do a story now, there are so many brilliant African, Indonesian colleagues that question the story that I tell. I, I really have to up the game. I don't think that was something that Burke was facing at the time because there was a very simple narrative of black suffering, white white knight. We're going back to that. And I think that's something that, that's really changed. And I, I think, I mean, that's a brilliant thing, you know. But so, so in fact, have our organizations, or some of them. I mean, some of us have, Libyans have, uh, you know, Saudis or whatever working with us. Uh, oh, some I'm working for them. <laughs> well, or, 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 or that, that may have its own problem. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, um, but, but I mean, um, you know, I mean, th th and that actually extends to the aid agencies in the sense that there's a big diaspora, vast Somali diaspora, which is incredibly informing to us, certainly. We have a Somali correspondent who, who is Somali and lives here. He's incredibly tapped. We don't employ him to be tapped into Somalia, although he is. We employ him to be tapped into the Somali diaspora here, mm -hmm. which is fantastic and which raises a great deal of money. Mm -hmm. but that, that's, that illustrates the way in which you know, the, the new media are changing what, what I think what the Western aid agencies have had over the last decades is essentially a, a monopoly on the, ma on the narrative. Yeah. You're allowed mm -hmm. to tell a certain story and no one could challenge it. And now, you know, a, an example that comes to mind for me is, you know, Coney 2012. Yeah, they, 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 uh, they put out that video, and then it's Ugandans who come into the Western media and say, bullshit. You know, Joseph Kony left Uganda five years ago. You're telling a story that isn't accurate anymore. And I think there, there is a new pressure on us because, it, you know, where, who is consuming this news now? You know, Africans are Did consuming Uganda the leave news. Kony? <laughs> <laughs> the, the North changed fundamentally from the story that was being told, and people corrected that. And, you know, it, 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 that, that correction, that, that ability to enter in to the narrative will, will fundamentally, I think, change the way, maybe, certainly the way media works, but I think it's going to have to change the narrative that NGOs are telling. Uh, because the narrative that is all working, you know, the, the development has, you know, has, has worked, and humanitarian assistance is saving lives is going to be increasingly challenged in our home societies by the people right there saying, well, it's not quite what you're saying. And the beautiful thing about Syria is that the situation has been so desperate that we've actually been forced to do something we should have been doing anyway, which is to use Syrians. You know, where does he come from? Who, what's his alliance to? Well, you've got to factor all that in. But nevertheless, we are drawing upon people who actually live this ghastly conflict. 
But that raises another massive, I mean, that opens a massive can of worms, which I think is again about journalism and access and potentially aid workers and access, because I think just now we're facing a situation where, I mean, as long as we were the knights in shi shining armors as, 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 as journalists, we could go in anywhere. If we look at the reporting that's coming out of Syria, if we look what Vice has done with regards to the reporting on, on ISIL, we, we're now finding that, that people are going in, in terms of the reporting, um, who have certain allegiance and 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 you know I mean the the vice report has made it very clear you need to be of a certain I don't know frame of mind or whatever you want to call it to get access to a certain situation return to Homs a phenomenal film but it was ultimately made by somebody who was quite close to the people on the ground. So where is then journalistic neutrality out of that? And, and yes, social media is opening doors in terms of reporting, but I think we have to look very carefully at what doors it is opening and who is able to walk through them. I am no longer able to go to a lot of places I'd like to go to. But if you're embedding with ISIL is a little problematic, what about embedding with Save the Children? No problem? World Food Programme? I'm going to stop because I feel like I've done a lot of talking. But I, I mean, when I work with I've NGOs, I've never embedded with any of them, so I don't know. I, I have a very I mean, clear. I, we wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't want to do it generally. <laughs> I mean, we'd certainly like like to sort of pop in and out and see how they're getting on. But I don't think we'd want to be. You might need of, their car or their, courtesy of no, their guest no, house. No, 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 no. Not a good idea. Um, I mean, you know, my experience. There have been moments where you know we invited journalists to come along. Um, to see certain things, but um, embed, I, I don't think that would be the right word to, to embed. I think aid agencies would also want to maintain that distance exactly for that neutrality. But I, I just wanted to um, get back to what you, you were saying. You come from a, a very purist line, I think. I see Mark. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Oh, carry I, on. Carry on. Okay. Ignore him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> um, you know, about access, I, th I think we need to be a little more nuanced in how much access we had as an aid agencies. You know, I'm going back to Biafra, going back to, you know, 68, 69. How much was, how access, how good was the access back then? And again, it was Cold War. There were a lot of places that aid agencies did not have access. I think today it's true that you need to, um, you need to be a lot better at negotiating with armed you know, non-state actors like ISIL, like um, the Taliban, like the Shabab. Um, and yes, sometimes certain organizations like Syrians, you know, like Somali, they have better access. And I think it's not a question of, is a white person better than, a, an, you know, a Syrian person? It's not an either or. Sometimes a foreigner will have the better position because they can get out and they cannot be put under pressure. Sometimes you need to say, okay, I'm going to work with a Syrian or whatever, a Somali organization, and, you know, I will try to see what their allegiance is or where they come from, but ultimately, if I want to deliver aid, I will have to make compromises. And I think, trans again, you know, um, transmitting or, or, or making that, um, getting that message across is very difficult. Um, very difficult for aid organizations to see, you know, the, the kind of to say, oh, I'm always going to be neutral, I'm always going to be independent. It's just not always that clear cut. Do the public demand neutrality, Mark, in your experience? I, I, I don't think they do. I, I, I think uh, in some ways, I, you know, what we've been talking about is that the public, you know, on one, on one hand, just wants to feel good about giving. They don't want to necessarily feel the complexities. I think, on the other hand, they, they want to understand what's going on in these places, and I do think they want to be able to follow those. But I, I don't think that the, I don't think that they're inside enough to understand the the. Rather, I, I think it is a cozy relationship, and an interrelationship, and an interdependency between a lot of media now who don't have the money uh, to go to many uh, many of the places around the world, who, but also, you know, with, with the immediacy of news, count on aid agencies that are there and tweeting and sending photos at, you know, as it happens, long before somebody can you know, leave London and, and arrive uh, to, to, to document a story. Uh, our own generated, you know, aid ag agency generated uh, news, images, B-roll, things like that are, are, you know, are, are something that the media needs. So and you don't need these guys? No, oh no, no, but, but you know, in return, 
in return, they, they uh, I would expect that they don't write too harsh a story about. <laughs> well, about, I, I, I know, would say that's exactly what's yeah. been happening. Yeah. Is, is in uh, you know in in the last thirty years, uh, everybody's gotten a way smarter about media. <laughs> You've upped your game. You're giving us B-roll. You're giving us access and whatever. You know, I'm going into a conflict situation where in the old days. Um, if I put it slightly bluntly, I, I could play on the vanity of a warlord and I'd, I'd get my way into a place. That isn't so easy anymore. Uh, these days, I get manipulated a lot more. And, you know, going back to Haiti, people I felt in Haiti, and I've been going a lot over the years, are really jaded about the media. Like people living in, in so called tent city, mm. which is what you mentioned, where. Um, you know, the development that, that, that was pledged hasn't arrived. Um, I, I filmed a so-called victim, and the victim actually refuses to be filmed because they say, oh, the likes of you have been here before, you know, and we never see any change. Why do you want to make it feel, um, tell my story? You make a living traveling around the world tell, tell, telling the stories of the likes of me, which is a really, really justified thing to say. I go to the next place, and I'm being really manipulated. There was this amazing guy outside Tent City in Haiti um, who basically spun this whole yarn about where um, former sort of virtual, the, the former revolutionaries stroke, I mean, people who'd killed a, a lot of people during the overthrow of, of Aristide were virtually hiding. And I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And then I spoke to some colleagues, and I realized that's how he made his living. He offered himself to the media as somebody who could get us the scoop. Oh, it's like the fake pirates in Nairobi. Well, like the yeah. fake pirates. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I go back to the question, and the question is, could the Burke thing happen again today? And I continue to say, yes, that's a very bold question. I mean, some of what we're addressing is what flows after that. And I agree with you on 80, absolutely 100%. But at the end of the day, we, today, we as journalists are frustrated largely by the performance of our own Western politicians. We are spooked by the most appalling decision that was made in 2001 to respond to a terrorist act in America by going to war in a place in which we had absolutely no working knowledge or relationships or anything which understood the tender situations on the ground. You go to a pilgrimage in Gom in Iran, as I did earlier this year, and there you find Syrian pilgrims, Iraqi pilgrims, Iranians setting off to Karbala in Iraq. They don't know any borders. These are not integral countries the way in which I mean, one of them is not even a country anymore, Iraq. I mean, you know, and this is because of our people. Our people did this. Uh, ISIS is a direct consequence of our people. And by our people, I mean us Westerners. Somehow we made this mess. Of course it was there ready to be made, but at least we could have left it to them to make it. But actually what we did was to go in and do it ourselves, which was a simply unbelievable thing, which many of us knew at the time. And many of us were cautious about, you sort of thought, this is so stupid, I can't believe it's really going to happen. Have these people ever been to Iraq? Have they ever been to Iran? Do they actually know that there is a difference between Sunni and Shia and how incredibly tender and difficult that is? Do they know any of that? Did they? The spooks knew, but did the politicians listen? Did the spooks know? I don't know. I don't know. How ignorant were they? History is going to be very, very cruel to the generation of people who took us to war both in Afghanistan and, and, and in Iraq, it has done unspeakable damage, and it's affecting everything everybody in this room does. Live, breathe, aid agency, reporter, political aspirant, aid aspirant, journalistic aspirant, all of us will be dogged by what has happened uh, in this last uh, decade and a half. Ava, what's happened to the aid industry as a result of 9-11 and the war on terror and all of that? Uh, I think, look, I, I think it's a myth to say that aid was never <coughs> politicized. It always was in a politicized environment. And I, I think to say that, that aid agencies were kind of aloof or, or suspended from politics, you know, while they want to remain neutral or some of them, they are, obviously, they operate in, an, in a politicized environment. And 9-11, yes, has, has had a tremendous impact on... on you know, questions like, do I take money from a donor who's also a belligerent in Afghanistan? You know, how far can an organization go and, and refuse funds from a donor who also has an army in a country? Those are incredibly difficult questions. And, you know, MSF is one of those more principled ones and can do that. Others maybe don't have that luxury to, to do that. So, yes, it has had an incredible impact. 
Ben, there are chairs yearning for bottoms, and there are people standing over there. Would any, if anybody would like to bring their bottom closer Look, to John, yeah. um, they're lots, very welcome. Lots of chairs, come on, come up, be part of us. I think we could have played that better somehow. Yeah. Uh, um, now people are worried about their bottoms, not the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Juliana, do you think it's uh, a, a changed world because of Iraq, Afghanistan, or do you think it was changing and that it was going to go that way anyway? Securitization, politicization, complexity. I, 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 th I think that, that there are two tracks here. I mean, I think if we're talking about the, the way people are portrayed, portraying themselves and, 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 and so on, I mean, the, the media and the digital revolution and all of that was always going to happen. Um, mm. So that was inevitable. But absolutely, I think it's a, it's a massively changed world post 9-11. Um, sort of slightly going back to what I said earlier, I, th I think I perceive an us and them uh, in a way that, 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 that makes me the enemy in many places. And, and I think also um, taking it back to the aid industry, you know, when you're now asking for, for money to be given to, um, to, to Syria, and, and at the same time you have the narrative of British fighters going to Syria, um, and then, you know, what just happened in Canada. It, it's just a layer of complexity. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, that, that there are no rights and wrong, and of course I'm in favor of giving, uh, giving money and, and making a cause, but I think the complexity has risen partly to a bigger understanding, but also partly be because the type of conflict that we're living through um, post-2009 um, has changed. But I think part of that complexity, and, and in particular growing out of what happened in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Syria, is you know the aid is being sold, in particular to the British public, uh, by, by the current government as in the national interest. You know, th this mm. is the selling point. Yes. You, you need to, to give this money elsewhere because it is in the national interest. And, uh, of course, the first thing is that doesn't help NGOs very much to be, to be wandering around a place like Syria mm. and having people on the ground think that you're acting in the national interest of the United Kingdom and the USA. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is that it, it creates this idea that, you, you know, what happened to compassion, it, you know, as opposed to self-interest as sort of the motivator? And, you know, why don't you have that much real concern about you know a, a, an Islamic state being set up essentially in, in northern uh, Niger northeast Nigeria, or you know why why did it take so long for Ebola? You know there, there's no there, there's nothing that changed about Ebola that has made you know the, the world react. It's simply the, the political asses of politi politicians in places like the U.S. and the U.K. You know. Became, we're on the line all of a sudden. And I mean, also the know. self defense argument. Yeah, no, that, it's that's coming it. on a, it, it, to it a is, plane near you. Yes, it is, yeah. it is absolutely. I, I'd yeah. still like to know about the chain of information. I mean, how hard did the aid agencies go to try and persuade the politicians that there was a crisis? I, I, you know, I I, know, I'm biased, but I think there was one aid agency, and I really want to know, you know what, all the aid agencies working in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, they had, they had health. Health teams on the ground doing I development mean, health. How many where, where have MSF statements call? passed your news desks and weren't picked up? MSF loads, actually. Mm. Uh, no, because I was due to go to Guinea at the time. I thought MSF did a superb job. They were, I mean, this was like way before the Ebola story broke. Um, sheer coincidence, I was meant to go to Guinea, but the only source of information I had was MSF, who did an like, a fantastic job, I thought. So you think that the Ebola was the same old story? Aid agencies. I mean, uh, Ebola is a strange story because you know Ebola is like a shark, right? You know, every, there's three Ebola cases in northern Congo, and usually it gets covered. I mean, Ebola was always one of those frightening, you know, you know, dark killers, and it, it always got news where malaria and, and you know loss of fever and, and Chagas and all these other diseases never got any. So there there was news coverage of it, but it, it, there's a and whole there lot of other reasons. And there have been different strains of Ebola which haven't been as disastrous. That's also a problem. In and, Congo, and it, 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 for instance, and it's just part of it has just been where it's I mean, broken we, out we, and, and we how it's broken out. We now suddenly have a raft of real experts <coughs> in this country who are telling us that back in March they knew. Well, how did was it that we didn't hear? Yeah. I mean, well, it's partly us, but it's also partly everyone. Where's that story? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, don't I, think, know. I think there's an interesting story in that, yeah. in, in how something how can did actually. We miss it? Yeah. You know, but just taking back what you were saying earlier on, I, I, I think we're on an interesting point now because what, what we haven't talked about is the public. There's somebody here with a, with a point. We're going to points. Because I think he knows. I, I, think we've got, I, mean, I think the media and the, the public stop a dead thing like this. 
Oh, I, thought you, I thought you so, knew how it was we didn't know. Well, I, I think it's, we didn't know because there weren't enough dead people on television. And that, unfortunately, is the reality. Often only the, the camera crews only turn up when there are dead people. But I was going at another point, which was the idea that there were scientists and even people possibly in aid agencies who did know and somehow didn't get into it. Hang on, isn't it your job to find things out? Well, look, <laughs> look, forgive me, there are 197 UN uh, countries and the rest of it. I mean, you've got to have your attention drawn to these things. And, uh, you know, it's all very well saying that how many, how many press releases passed your news desk. But these days, actually, people target individuals. And I was never targeted. Now, I mean, they may not be worth targeting, but, but generally speaking, you would think you try and hit people with this. And I, I certainly did not know until about June, <coughs> July. And then, then the real practicalities of how on earth you find it and want to go. All right, let's have an but experiment. Is, Before we go to questions, yeah. which are the ones, which are the next Ebola's that everyone's going to say, I told you so? Which are the forgotten, unreported crises that are well, about it, to blow? It's pretty special. Sudan? Yeah. Latin America, thousands of kids turning up on the US border mm. with the drugs and crime. Yeah. And coming back to, you know, the, the number of deads, I'm not sure that moves people. Syria, 200,000, you know, migrants dying every day in the Mediterranean. It's literally, you know, around the corner. Not no, a lot. One more from Juliana, then I think we'll open up. Because I think we're, we're, we're forgetting something really important. There, there was a uh, audience research done on, on BBC4 recently, and I'm sure somebody else will remember it more, better than me. But basically, a BBC4 Today program basically found that at a time when they were reporting a lot on Syria, they were reporting a lot on Ebola, they had a massive audience drop because everybody thought it was too much negative foreign reporting. So, so in, in, in that place, we're, we're in a massive trap mm -hmm. as, as news broadcasters. What do we do? We're losing an audience because we're telling the ugly truth. How do we respond to that? Do we actually suddenly make bad news good? Do we start telling the story about the one doctor in, in the Ebola case who saves mm -hmm. everything so that our audience feels good over breakfast? But, but I mean, th th there is a difficult scenario there. So, you know, the answer of let's show more dead people, I don't think that is necessary. You know, making it simple. I don't think mm -hmm. that's the answer, and I think the BBC Today program conundrum is a really big one. How do we mm -hmm. respond as aid agencies, as the news to the, to to that fatigue that is going on and is mm -hmm. real? Could I just say something on Latin America? Because actually, the untold story of Latin America is the fantastically positive impact that Afghanistan and Iraq have had on Latin America. Because ever since the Afghan and Iraq adventures dawned, there's not been a coup. Not a single military coup, not a single dictatorship. <laughs> Hang on a minute, what's happened? Did the gringo go home? <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> so we'll take a round of questions. We'll throw them whichever way it makes sense. Uh, we may get questions via Tanya from the internet as well. So go ahead. Maybe you could introduce yourselves before you ask your question. Thanks. I'm Thackeray. I've worked with the 10 human rights groups since the early days of amnesty. Uh, Juliana's comment uh, seems to be moving towards, can we look into the future a bit? Uh, does the public care? But uh, I think there are much more complex questions about how it cares and what the train, what John was saying, the train of information coming through. And I'd like to ask about anarchy. Yves Gacor, I don't know what, whether you defend him against that. I took him aside after he was on at Chatham House a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about impartiality mm -hmm. and the need for it. And I asked him, what kind of governments, uh, governance can you work with anymore? And I said, what about, you know, international, the UN, you know, world government? What about Swiss neutrality? Which governments support you? And he said, none of them do. He said, uh, ISIS has brought a new stage of things. We are now in anarchy. Uh, what they do now, the fashionable thing, is you kill off the doctors, you destroy the hospitals. He said the only people he can now rely on is the military. I mean, five years ago, the, you know, Swiss, the Red Cross would not talk about needing the military. Uh, the whole system is breaking down. The human rights groups are getting much, much larger, and they have prestige. There's no accountability or jurisdictional problems, and the governments are disintegrating. Now, how are you going to operate in an environment where governments disintegrate, and you have only military, <laughs> and uh, the human rights groups are asked to intercede? They're unelected. They're unaccountable for. Nobody even knows who they are. Who, where's good faith lie in all this? I mean, if you're talking about donors, and how, how does the... Inf I met, I met somebody from Mid San who's in South Sudan, and she was the only person there, it seemed, and she had not been able to find out what was going on. And yet people look to Mid Saint Frontier and they think they're actually engaged. But that's anarchy. That's disintegration of the whole train of information. I mean, how do you guys see this? 
in the field. Anybody want to jump, join in on that and we'll take, try, try and spread it around? Sir? The one at the back? <laughs> Gentleman in the middle? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jean-Michel Grand from uh, Action Against Hungary. So, just two, two points uh, to, to reflect on what uh, has been said, and uh, I will try to be brief. The, the first one uh, about the information and the fourth information. I think we, there's one case in 2008 when there was a food crisis. We made an analysis about the responses. The alert was sent in January, but the responses came only in April and May, and the major factor was media. The conclusion of that seems obvious, but as an organization is about, it's not, in some extent it's about how we convince the media, but for us it's about how we create the news. And more and more is about how do we have direct access to the people overpassing on overcrowded uh, media who are very selective, rightly, on what they can do during their, their short time. And therefore, how as an organization we become a news agency in some extent and having direct access to the people. That's the first point. The second point I wanted to, reflect is that the people are selective in the response, uh, in their emotion. Natural disaster, Pakistan, Haiti, this is something that they feel that tomorrow can happen to them and they give. Conflict, we don't launch any more appeal on conflict. It's a waste of money. People are not giving money when it's conflict. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, forget about getting money for this kind. Gaza was interesting, the last one not the one before, but this one, we receive a lot of interest of people really willing to support. Difficult to explain why, but it seems that, is it the, the number of casualties, is it people are fed up, I don't know, but we receive a much more positive response on that last conflict of Gaza uh, than in the previous one. Interesting to see potentially how you felt, you felt it in a, from your point of view on, a, on that last case. Okay, Eva, maybe on, on the first question of working mm. in an anarchic world yeah. and trying to be honest, as you were saying earlier on, how do you explain that? Well, anarchic, yes, but also there are certain states that are becoming a lot more assertive than they ever were. You know, Turkey, Russia. So there's anarchy, yes, in Syria, for example, but then there's also this assertiveness by some states, which also makes it difficult to operate for aid agencies. And with ISIL, it, it's true. Look, it's, it's sobering to see that, you know, you've done all these years of engaging with non-state armed actors. You have really good arguments. You say, look, you care about the population. Surely you wouldn't want your sister to be raped. You wouldn't want your brother to be killed. And that resonated. ISIL, I think, is on a, on a path of purification and destruction. Those arguments, and it's going to be extremely difficult. And I think aid agencies just have to do some thinking, how are we going to approach that? I don't have the solution. I think if I did, you know, I, but it's going to be extremely difficult. Yeah. And just coming maybe back to um, Jean-Michel, I, I think I'm the only one who said whether it can be, could, whether the 84 could repeat, uh, have a repeat today. And I would also disagree. But I would, I would say because, if it was a tsunami, yes, but any conflict, no. Because people, like you were saying, and Gaza again, yes, was an exception, but people are biased with conflicts. There are the good guys and the bad guys, whereas in natural disasters or famine, it's only the, the, the good guys. But that's what he was reporting, a natural yep. disaster. Yeah. And that's the question we were asked. The, the, but, does your, but the lesson there is, <laughs> I see Wendy may shake her head off shortly, yes. so can you give the microphone to Wendy, please? One nil. <laughs> Thank you. Wendy Fenton from the Humanitarian Practice Network at ODI. Well, I was actually in Darfur in 1984, 1983, and, and for several years after that, and had many colleagues in Ethiopia at the time. But I'd say it wasn't just reporting on the natural disaster. At that time, the political issues became known in Ethiopia as well. So I think that um, I also find it really hard to recognize the difference between then and now, you know, having watched what's happening. The, the only major difference that I remember is that when we were in the field in Darfur during those days, journalists came very, very infrequently. You didn't have the minute by minute coverage that you have now. And even for aid agencies, there was very little oversight of what you did you were left to get on with it, and there were, you had telex and you had radio. And, you know, we're working in very different environments now, very, very different mm. environments. But I wouldn't say that, that that disaster in Ethiopia 
was also reported as a political crisis. And that was one of the first time, I and we had Biafra as well, which was a political crisis. So we, you know, we, we tend to think that what's happening now doesn't have a history, or that it never happened before, it's new. But if we look at the lessons of history, we find that actually, you know, it isn't new. We just have new dimensions that we're dealing with. I like what you say very much. I absolutely agree. I was a student during Biafra, and it was the cause, the cause of the time. Absolutely, 100%, and yet it was p political. But what I would like to say, given that we're sitting in the frontline club, I mean, what is actually happening now, which just was non-existent in those days, is that there's a raft of freelancers and people who either, amazingly, at their own expense, or at an aid agency's expense, or at our expense. I mean, Channel 4 News uh, runs an independent fund, uh, which, which allows independents to come to us and say, this is what I can do, this is what I want to do, or this is what I've done. Uh, do you want it? And, and it diversifies what we do. And I, I oddly enough, I'm trying to get um, James Harding from the BBC to come down and look and see what we do. Because I think it would do the BBC a world of good to have an independent fund. Because it would diversify the nature of some of their news gathering. Um, and that is the biggest difference of all, is that there are far, far more people in the field un unleashed from any organisation. Um, I mean, some of them are troubling and difficult. But many of them are, are, are very hardworking and very devoted and committed. And if you look at the, the Frontline Awards last week, I mean, incredible people who had produced material which no conventional media organization could match. <coughs> so. uh, just a question for John. Sorry, my name is James East with World Vision. Um, in connection with the question, do the public still care in connection with conflict and disaster reporting? John, you... <coughs> did a very powerful report from Gaza. A um, number of powerful reports. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there was, one, there was one in particular which was very emotional. And I'm not quite sure if it actually went on, on TV or if it was it did just not. on the web. Did not. I wondered why it had only been on the web and whether, whether you saw that report as impartial. Because I think a lot of people perhaps didn't see the report as impartial. I think from an NGO perspective, we, you know, I tweeted about it. I thought it was an, it was an amazing, amazing piece. But I, at the same time, I questioned whether that was truly a sort of a, a, an impartial and independent piece. And what was the effect? Did the public care? And what, and what did they care about, do you think? Well, I can only tell you that when, when I was relatively soon after on the ground in Scotland, investigating quite definitely the most electrifying political process I've ever observed in this country, informed alive, both uh, sides incredibly articulate. Uh, people stopped me to talk about Palestine. And I, I, that has never happened before in my life. Um, and uh, so, but as to the history of that particular thing, look, um, it took three, it took the exact amount of time that ex it exists for now. I mean, all that happens, I came back and a very assiduous online team said, look, we, we need to put up a vlog. I said, what the hell's that when it's at home? <laughs> and, and, and they said, come on, John, you've done a few before. And I said, oh, yeah, vaguely I remember you. A video blog, they said. And I sat down and I literally just, they just said, so, what do you think, kind of thing. And what you saw is what I said. Bang. And they put some pictures on it. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it crosses the line or whether, or whatever, I'm told it, it it, it did, but at the end of the day, listen, when I, when I go to hell or heaven, I'll be judged by what I did uh, in all my stories, in all my work. Um, and I don't resile from what I did, but I have no idea whether it was legal or whether it offended <laughs> or whether it helped or whether it hindered. That is what I did. And I, it, I, look, it wasn't a sin. Um, the question really is, did, did you find the public well, of course, there was an absolutely massive, massive response. Yeah, obviously, massive. I'm from all over the world. I don't know how it happened. How did some obscure hack in Britain end up <laughs> getting responses from Argentina, from, you know, um, uh, Ho Chi Minh City? For, I mean, how? How do these things work? I mean, I know, I, know, I know how rock stars managed to do that. But hacks, talking about somewhere Gaza has never attracted interest. And yet suddenly now, and not I think just because it of my work, zero. 
What? <laughs> well, of course. It, it, it has, of course. No, no, no I meant it from, from, from a British perspective. Yeah. It, um, uh, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. But I'm certainly proud of my television reporting from Gaza. Uh, uh, what went out online, it had an effect. And uh, it, it, it certainly it, it, it referenced the dead on both sides. It was certainly not, it, not in, uh, you know, it wasn't partial in that sense. I gather that the words that, affect, that offended, if they offended, was, I think I said, if, if you are watching this, if you are reading about this, then together we can make a difference. Ma, I mean, that I that might be true. <laughs> I mean, shit. <laughs> I, I, I think one of the, the, the what, I think what you're getting at, though, is just the, the, the media landscape has changed, I think also for the NGOs, in that being detached and neutral, it, it doesn't sell anymore. I mean, people want something that's authentic. Yeah, but and I'm not calling for that. And I, I'm not calling for any of this campaigning nonsense. I, and it, it's not, I don't think that has anything to do with campaigning. I think what it has to do with, and I, I, I mean emotionally detached, I think what people want to see is, you know, not an aid agency describing what, it, you know, what it's like for this person over there to have multidrug resistant tuberculosis. I think it's the blog from that person online talking about their lives that people want to, and have access to and want to see. And I think the old, the old model of, you know, sort of the, the pontificator or the expert remaining somehow neutral, I, I, I agree completely. It's not about taking sides and, and losing that sort of neutrality. But there's something about standing firm with, with in some ways, what, what you feel is right. And standing firm with the victims and with pain and suffering and, and you know, getting rid of that detachment that, you know, you know really it creates a distance. and, and you know, you know, immediacy. You know, is is the buzzword, right? Or at least it was the buzzword back when I was working. If anybody mm. dug into the mm. library at, at, at ITN and dragged out Central American coverage from the 1980s, early 1980s, you know, I wasn't detached. I was looking at something that was absolutely horrific. The 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 the, the Americans were training uh, uh, an army which was lined up with death squads, working on behalf of the oligarchs, murdering peasants. That is not acceptable. I'm sorry, but I mean, I'm not going to go around saying, Julius, rather, they've, they've, they've got them firing rather well. You know? I mean, <laughs> they, they target awfully well. Um, do, you know, do you face those kind of problems, Al Jazeera, any more than anywhere else? I worry if we're making it a little bit simple at the moment. I mean, I, th I think good journalism needs to put people in the dock, but I think that, that there are ways and ways of, of doing it. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things I like about uh, doing, occasionally doing investigative journalism is that you actually get to go after somebody who's done something wrong. And if you do investigative journalism well, you have an effect and, um, you know, you have a very palpable effect in, in that you don't just say somebody is wrong, but actually if you do investigative journalism really well, you get somebody locked up or fined or so on. And it can actually be quite liberating for journalists, especially if you've been watching conflicts and, and, and you know, the things where you have to be neutral a lot to, to, to become an active player and to be in the pursuit of somebody who's done something wrong. Uh, but I, I would still say that I see my duties and those, you know, as somebody who tells sto stories in, in long form, as, as somebody, I want to reveal dynamics. And if I reveal the dynamics well, <coughs> the right and wrongs will reveal themselves through that. And, and, and to me, that, that, that is the journalism that I like to do, because I, will, I also think that's rather than me telling somebody what is right or wrong, um, I'm, I'm looking at a situation and I say that's how it functions, that's the internal logic, that's why somebody's getting rich of aid, or this is why, you know, this is why something happens. And, and, and that in long form would be my goal. Mm. The problem is that the, the, the mainstream generally has four minutes, Yes. Uh, or, or 1 minute 15, or 1 minute 30. I agree, and that's why I've, and, you know, and, I speak and about and I, But, but I, mean, I absolutely do not advocate for partial news reporting. I'm absolutely opposed to it. I hate it. It's, it's, uh, it's not what we're in business for at all. Um, and uh, I don't think I would have put that on the television. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, look, we're living in a, in a very difficult age where we're trying to find our way on a multi-platform thing, you know. I mean, television, when Burke did this, that's all there was. What would Burke have said online in those days? 
I defy you to suggest that he wouldn't have said, I have seen utterly horrific sights. Somebody really does have to do something about this. That's what you would say. You would say, I've seen horrific sights. You can watch my piece on television. It's quite revealing. I mean... Gentleman in the blue shirt. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Johan, also from World Vision. Uh, last week, I came back from South Sudan for a trip that was supposed to last about two weeks. It lasted a few days longer because we got stuck in the middle of a UN base due to conflict and couldn't get out of there. So it, this made us wonder how you could get a place like that into the news in the middle of Ebola and all of that. And it still proved to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, so what we were wondering when we were sitting there was whether... George Clooney is the answer. <laughs> I should have thought of that. Yeah, if you have his number, I'll take it afterwards. <laughs> Oscar Pistorius, if, it's, you know, if you want to get Africa. <laughs> well, he took a bit of news as well, unfortunately. Um, but what we were wondering when we were sitting there was whether what's happening now is that given the, the number of crises at the same time, so you have Ebola, you have Iraq, the Middle East, Mali, Somalia, and all of this, all these places, is that the definition of what actually constitutes a proper crisis has gone down, and the threshold of what's actually worth reporting now is if it used to be, I don't know, 10,000 lives before, it's now become 100,000, and if, the, if a crisis is worth $500 million, used to be a crisis, now you have to have $5 billion, and effectively, it's just going down and down and down as you have more and more crisis, which means you have attention spread over a number of different issues. You have to explain to people that a country called the Central African Republic actually exists, mm -hmm. which my friends didn't believe when I went there. They thought it was Congo. It was the same thing. So you have, to, you have all these debates now that seemingly didn't happen before. So if, if that's what's happening, and effectively the attention span and the money span is becoming thinner and thinner, how do we actually address that in a way that we can do something useful about it. Eva, I think also we're talking about people's attention and whether they care, and we're equating it with cash, and perhaps that was something we should have dealt with earlier on. Yeah, can I deal with something Please else? Please, go for it. <laughs> yeah. um, it's also something else. It's, it's this wish to want to believe in a success story. That you had that in East Timor, you know, the youngest state and success story, the UN kind of withdrew and bang, 2006 you know, it just kind of disintegrated, maybe exaggerated, but, you know, it, it, quite a crisis. Sudan, South Sudan as well, newest country, you know, you, you kind of, there's this image of we build a state and then we go on from the crisis and it becomes better. But it's not that easy. Afghanistan, same mistake, kind of you pass from a crisis into this development and state building and you want to believe it and you, you kind of ignore the facts that it's actually not as stable as you wanted to be. Um, and how do you draw attention to that? I think partly that is the responsibility of both emergency humanitarian actors and development actors. And there's another issue because they don't always kind of see eye to eye in, you know, on a lot of issues. But I think there's this, it's almost like we want to believe in a feel good story and declare something, you know, as a success or something, a, a country as stable. <coughs> And I think that there's a danger in it because then we ignore signs. Um, you know, elections aren't a sign that a country is stable. Just because you have elections doesn't, you know, you can have a dictatorship, quite stable, actually. Um, so I think there's this, um, I think we need to be careful about that. I think politicians want to believe in that. And I think aid agencies, humanitarian agencies have a responsibility to draw attention to the fact that it's not that simple. Do you have a lady there? <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm Charlotte, I'm from the NGO Mercy Corps and uh, I just wanted to go back to one of the things Juliana said about the positive stories and you know for that you might need for breakfast etc. Um, I think like for example we've got a project in Gaza on internet startups and we know that even in those hardest places the, the economic development needs to continue, uh, markets need to continue etc and those positive stories do have a role to play in that, and I was just wondering how much space you think you have to be able to tell also those positive stories, even in complex situations. There was one more behind, lady behind you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Tori, I'm Charity's lead at Research at Commerce. Um, we did polling among the British public last month, and we found that almost uh, two-thirds, I think it was around 63%, felt that British aid spending should be focused almost exclusively on disasters and sort of emerging emergencies. This combined with a sort of long-held 
British belief that, you know, everyone thinks international aid spending is wasted or should be spent at home and combined with this idea of sort of simplistic success story reporting. I just wanted to slightly reframe the question for sort of the aid side. Does this pose a long-term problem that donations and attention from the British public are sort of going to lurch from disaster to disaster, which combined with the sort of sense of disasters are going to get a higher bar to clear? Is this a problem for agencies in terms of long-term, more stable funding, being able to sort of convince public that it's not just spending in an emergency, it's being able to invest and build health systems that can respond to sort of shocks when they happen? And is that a problem more long-term? I was trying to combine those, but it didn't work. Ju Juliana, good stories at breakfast? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about breakfast. And I mean, I, I, I think that does happen. You know, I listen a lot to BBC World Service, and you can certainly see where the news are in the morning and at what point it, it gets softer. Uh, I, I think this sort of story that you, you're talking about, about internet startups, um, that does get um, these stories, I mean, at least on Al Jazeera, but not just on Al Jazeera. I think they do get covered, but I think the question is what makes it into the news. And, and you know, news always seems to be about the disasters and the breaking stuff. And, I mean, there's a reason for that, too. Um, but then I, I think, you know, if, if, if you're sitting at the other side, um, wh where else can you pitch these stories? You know, is there a tech show that you can um, um, pitch them to? Can, if, if you can't get it onto news, then there are other places. And, yeah, I mean, the BBC's got tech shows. Um, we, you know, we, we do quite a lot of documentaries at Al Jazeera. So, you know, so again, something about internet startup. And I was really amazed about um, the entrepreneurs that are returning and the businessmen returning to Mogadishu. You know, on one level, you have a lot of violence and a lot of conflict playing out. On another level, you, you have business starting up. That, 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 that was amazing. It was like nearly there were two parallel worlds in, in Mogadishu. And I think that is absolutely worth reporting on because not just the terrorist attacks but, but the, the business and, and the sort of new dawn is a reality too but I think that requires um, a lot more careful placing or a lot more th thoughtful placing with news organizations maybe. Thank you. Mark, the, yeah. the Comrades polling has uh, been going for some time about British attitudes about aid and I wanted also perhaps to, while you answer that, yeah. some disasters get too much money, right? But, I mean, yes. Because look at you know South South Sudan, Central African Republic, there, there are you know Congo. There are lots of places where money is needed, and where unfortunately, uh, you know NGOs are, are unable to act because <laughs> their money is tied into specific contracts to work in specific places. I mean, I think one of the things that that MSF is most envied for is the fact that it built independent fundraising <coughs> you know, from the beginning. If you're going to be an emergency organization, you need the money before the emergency, and. People, we, we sell that to people, and they get it. They give us money for the next emergency, uh, because, and we essentially have a pool, you know, of of money that can be used in any given year for what crops up. Um, I think what what the bigger problem you're getting at, though, and it was something I touched on what Eva said earlier, and that is that, you know, development is hard. It is getting, you know, there's a critique around development. There's a critique that it doesn't work. There's a lot of different models, entrepreneurship and uh, it just more local based. It is it is a model that, that's under attack, and yet the large organizations. It's not a question of humanitarian organization or development organization. The you know the humanitarian cartel, the, the top five or six includes World Vision, Care, Save the Children, and Oxfam, all and MSF. But the, you know th those are agencies that have significant develop you know more significant development components than humanitarian components, and yet. The, you know, the, the one critique is that there's a real mixing of you raise your money on the on the big emergency, and what are you spending it on? You're you're funding essentially a lot of programs that are the longer term programs. And how do you yeah how do you engage a public and gain the funding for the, the, the necessary programs? The the the, the, the crisis. The, the, yeah, you know, one way of looking at the crisis in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea right now is that. Years, you know, over a decade of development spending to build a health care system didn't work. There was no health care system there. And, and Ebola went, went wild. And, and, and how do you get that kind of funding and get the programming that is actually effective and builds even a rudimentary health care system so you don't have to start out with a poster that says Ebola is real? You know, <laughs> if, that's, if that's where you start, Ebola is real, you've already lost. So... I, I think what, what, you're, what you're touching on is a really, really important point for, for a lot of organizations, and that is, you know, how do you, 
how do you do the, mo the much more important long-term work when what people want to save is saving, uh, fund is saving lives right now? And, you know, discussions around <coughs> impact of aid that the UK government is having, you know, only, only heightens that. You know, you need to be able to you know, show quantifiably what you've done. And the business of development isn't quantifiable. It's transformation. It's long-term. It's not going to happen in a six-month funding cycle. Thanks. Final thoughts, comments, questions? Thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer. I work for, I used to work for an aid agency in Ethiopia, but now I work for a company that um, provides secure communications to media and aid agencies working in conflict zones. Um, Not to the Ethiopian army. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, I, I had a question uh, a little bit more specific. I, I think that, you know, that the media does have the power to make the public care. But one thing that I, I don't understand and I often wonder about um, in the course of my job, because I have to do a great deal of media monitoring, mostly in Africa and the Middle East, is when when the media decides to cover a story and what makes the media de decide to cover a story and when because um, to your point about Ebola and about not really you know necessarily having the right not being told about it not being contacted enough not having enough of an opportunity to cover it early enough to make a difference I I don't understand that because I have an Al Jazeera news app on my phone because I find Al Jazeera to be the best, to have the best coverage for Africa. Um, and from March, there was, Ebola is very interesting, so I was, I was watching it. And from March, there was a story in the top 10 Africa section stories, you know, every other day, a news story about Ebola from Al Jazeera. And it looked like it was out of control sort of from April. And I went home to the US at the end of July. Um, and from one day to the next, it was a massive story. And it was on the Today Show and leading the evening news every night. But nothing much different had happened. I'd been wondering for months why the other news outlets you know, weren't picking it up. Um, and then when they did, acted like it was something that you know, just, just hit. Um, so I, that's something that I you know, routinely don't <laughs> understand. Um, just a small other thing was that I was working um, for an election campaign in Kenya in the last presidential election in 2011, um, 2012 to 2013. And I had a Times reporter in a car driving him to a political rally for nine hours. And so I said, you know, there was a lot going on in the Eastern Congo, the DRC at the time, and really shocking stuff. I had a lot of friends who were working there. And I, I said, you know, how come people aren't covering, you know, the human rights abuses that are going on and you know what's actually happening to these you know these tiny children and everything surely that's the most shocking thing that you know anybody can put on the cover of a newspaper or on the evening news and he just said the editor people don't want to see it you know people don't want to see it it's too disturbing editors won't run it can't do the story can't do that kind of story and so sometimes i wonder if if the media you know isn't isn't being responsible enough right um, john other media being, how does something well, get uh, on your show? It's a tall order to ask the media to be responsible. I mean, that's, a, that's not something which um, is our sort of stock in trade. We, we, we are, you, I mean, look, the, the serious point is there are so many different factors that play. First of all, there is a limited budget, uh, a very limited budget. I mean, it's extremely expensive. Just to ensure our cameraman in Ebola-stricken Sierra Leone has cost us £12,000 for four days. £12,000. That's, that's two full foreign escapades, if you like. Um, so cost <laughs> is a, a major consideration. Then what are the other guys doing? That, that, that's another consideration. It, it's a competitive industry. Um, you know, it works like capitalism. It's working in a capitalist system. Um, uh, and then, of course, there are desires to do something which nobody else is doing, to get an exclusive or whatever. I, I think Ebola has had a completely, I, I've, in 40 years I've never come across anything like Ebola, in which, you know, there is a real danger to the people going to the field, <coughs> as the aid workers have shown. I mean, they are the prime, you know, uh, victims of this, be they Liberian, uh, Sierra Leonean, uh, or, or, or Guinean. The first people stricken 
uh, are, are the local health workers. Mm. The next people stricken are the international health workers. And then the next people stricken are, of course, uh, some of the media. And all along, of course, the people themselves are stricken desperately. But that is a horrible environment in which to try to sort out how to cover it. Um, we're late. We're trying. Um, but I, I, I mean, I don't have any answers for you. I mean, you, you know, Eastern Congo, we committed an enormous amount of, sport, uh, of resource. Lindsay Hilson was there morning, noon and night. All sorts of other people we have sent over time. Jonathan Miller, you know, uh, and it isn't fatigue. It's just how can you tell the same story again differently? I mean, it's t that's the problem. It, 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 how do you do it? Um, and then suddenly there's a whole other raft of things. The mm. Turkish border, mm. uh, the Iranian-Iraqi border, the Saudi border. I mean, there's stuff all over the place. Then there's the Central African Republic. And South Sudan hardly gets a look in these days because people find it so difficult to locate and, and kind of... <laughs> you know, I mean, locate intellectually. I don't mean physically. <laughs> I mean, locate... Um, it's it's south know, of it, Sudan. It, it, I hope yeah, somebody no, tweeted no, that, mean, right? Somebody tweeted that. No, I, I, mean, I mean it in, a, in an intellectual sense. How do, you, how do you place it in the world in which the viewer is... Is, is watching. It, 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 it's a big, big challenge. In the meantime, there's a gunman <coughs> in the parliament in yeah. Ottawa. Right. And okay, one person's dead. And horrible thing, but it's a new story. Uh, Pistorius. God save us. How much Pistorius do we need? Okay, I, 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 promised, I, I promised one more question to this lady here. I think that's probably our last question. Um, Jenny Humphreys from British and Irish Agencies Afghanistan Group. Um, I've got a quick question that um, is based on comments made by Ava and, and the lady with the Comrades Research. Um, Ava said that there is a, a sort of a duty for aid agencies to report that a country that has just had elections, I, I'm imagining we're talking Afghanistan here, um, isn't stable and uh, that there are ongoing issues there. Um, and then that's sort of balanced with a, a comment that the, the British public um, are keen to really only focus on uh, sort of fundraising for emerging or, or sort of critical emergencies. Um, we're a, a member agency um, network and, and we represent 30 organisations working in Afghanistan. And our members are desperately trying to get stories out there that, that there are um, recurring and, and ongoing needs. Um, we did some research recently um, to review the amount of coverage. It, this was the um, print media, unfortunately not the broadcast media, but uh, coverage over the last five years of the British media um, and of numerous stories, only 4.2% covered development issues. Um, and unfortunately, about 50% of those were then negative stories about development going awry. Um, so my question is simply, how can uh, media and development and humanitarian agencies work more effectively when you are looking at a sort of situation of protracted complex crisis like Afghanistan? I think partly, you know, we've covered kind of the public, the media that, you know, the, the public communication, but I think we didn't cover, and that would require a whole evening, kind of the bilateral, the behind the scene, the, the, the discussions that aid agencies have with, you know, capitals, with donors, with, with governments, and I think that's an important aspect. I think something important that you mentioned, what gets into the news is negative. And it, it's a pity that sometimes there are success stories, or perhaps success story is a big word, but there are, there is progress. Um, and it's, you know, how do you weigh between what is really going badly and saying, well, there is something good as well. So, look, I don't, I don't have a recipe, but I think there's a number of different layers. So there's the public communication, there's the there's the amongst organizations as well, because we're not always very good at communicating amongst each other. Then there's the discussion with, with capitals, with donors, so on various levels. But I think that needs to be sustained, and that requires resources. And quite often, organizations don't have, that, have those resources. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up now. Um, final words, Mark? Final thoughts? Wisdom. <laughs> words of wisdom. No, maybe I'll go back to something you said at the beginning. You talked about the three pillars, the public. The, uh, the aid agency and the media. And I think, you know, 
the, the growth of social media and the way in which, for instance, in Africa, I think I heard this morning that over the next 10 years, you know, where is the internet going to grow, internet access? It's in Africa, and I think, yeah, the, the, you know, at a certain point, that, that triangle has to become a, a square because you know, people in affected mm. countries are going to be an equal participant in this, in this discussion and debate, and it's going to change the, yeah. you know, the, the three pillars, that, uh, all of us, in different ways. Eva, final thoughts? Squares? Um, yeah, maybe just, um, yeah, we didn't cover kind of affected communities, whatever that is. And I think a lot of the reporting, for example, in, in Syria, because we've been following that quite a bit um, at HPG, comes from Syrians themselves. A lot of what we see comes actually from Syrians themselves. And I think that's something that I certainly, when I started out 20 years ago, that wasn't there. Um, so I find that mm. fascinating. Not always easy to absorb, not always mm. easy to say how credible is it, but it's a phenomenon that we need to deal with. Juliana. Yeah, sort of slightly similar. I think one of the things we we didn't have time to go deeply enough is is the whole emergence of new media and changing media, and um, going back. I mean, you mentioned the word co compassion a lot, and we were talking about Ebola. Some of the best reporting that I saw early stages Ebola was actually on BuzzFeed. They had a, this amazing female health correspondent, and BuzzFeed is like ten ways to kill your hamster. And suddenly <laughs> they, they come out with this incredibly compassionate and human reporting. And I think we're actually in the middle of something that I'm, I'm genuinely excited about in a changing media field where not just who tells the stories and who in the broadest way from BuzzFeed to the Syrian contributor is changing, but also how we tell the story. And I think maybe that's also sort of how to what you were saying, that a different type of stories will find the audience. Well, I think we've been to some dark places tonight, but I'm really delighted that the panel has come back to an essentially optimistic view. I mean, I think, I think ultimately the digital age is a liberating age. Mm. I think it's full of uh, all sorts of pitfalls and access to dark places. But I think, you know, things can only get better. Um, and um, I think that more people who are affected by the issues that all of us are passionate about are able to communicate and are able to communicate their view of what, what is going on in their lives. And I think that's good for all of us. And I, I think it's an exciting age to be around. It's the best age. I always call this the, gold, the dawning of the golden age of journalism. Don't know about the golden age of aid, but it's certainly the golden age of, aid of journalism. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much to ODI and to Online Club. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Have a good evening.